my name is Aria Chambers and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Just two notices before we begin. First, if you're joining the webinar via mobile device, please note that you'll have the option of viewing either a panelist or the presentation, and you can change your view by simply swiping left or right on your screen. And second, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar via the questions chat section. At the end of the presentation, I'll read out your questions for panelists to answer. With us today, we have AJ Patel and Chris Mahoney. AJ is our business development manager and has over a decade of experience in the oil and gas industry, including time as a reliability engineer and maintenance and planning execution lead. Chris is an application specialist who joined our team in 2018 and provides solutions that repair, protect, and improve all facilities with applications like secondary containment coatings, concrete repairs, cooling tower repairs, and more. For today's webinar, we're going to touch on these three main subjects. What is considered a secondary containment? Who are the governing bodies that regulate containment area standards? And then lastly, we'll go through some examples of secondary containment maintenance issues, as well as big solutions. With that, I'm going to pass it over to AJ to get us started. All right. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction as always, Aria. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome on this uh, beautiful Thursday. At least that's what it is here in New Jersey, a beautiful Thursday morning. Uh, as Aria mentioned, our conversation today is going to be framed around secondary spill containment. Um, and, you know, secondary spill containment comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. Uh, there's various methods for it, but we're going to have a few uh, areas of concentration today. Um, so specifically, we're going to talk in terms of metal dikes. So when we think about secondary containment, we think about metal dikes, we're looking for situations right where my, my laser pointer is. Uh, you may have multiple tanks or maybe even a single tank. We know what the volume is inside. We want to build a, a tank dike out of metal to essentially hold and contain the material. Uh, in the event that, that that vessel might be substantially larger, you'll actually see these um, containment dikes actually come in as concrete. And so, you know, we'll have a little conversation around some of the challenges that can happen there as well. Uh, another application, in, in, in fact, this is this is a, like a dike except for just the last order, so we call it curbing. And this is when you want to keep, you have two large areas and you know that you have a chemical or some kind of uh, material that you don't want to spill into over to another area. You generally understand the volume of what's being held in area one versus area B and, or area two, and you basically want to prevent it from getting over the proverbial hump. So Curbing is another type of secondary containment. And then finally, um, when we think about loading and offloading areas, so a lot of times we transport uh, chemicals and other materials by rail, by truck, you know, and so those, those vehicles and those transportation methods, we also have to think about secondary spill containment there. Why do we have to do that? Because if you're in the process of loading and unloading, something happens to the disconnect, it falls off, it pops out, and you know, we've seen that before, and now all of a sudden you have whatever was supposed to be inside of the, um, was, was supposed to be easily moved from, you know, the, the tank vessel itself to another tank vessel has come out. So you, oftentimes you'll see a setup like this, and, and we have an example of one, but, you know, there, you, you'll see little holes like you'll see here, and essentially those are drains. So you'll see them pour out from the primary containment of the drains, and, and really they serve a common purpose. And that's to stop a spill from leaving its primary containment area and causing harm to people or the environment. So why do we do it? Because, look, it's the right thing to do, but the government tells us to do it as well. So two, two kind of uh, factions control this. Uh, the first one, the first agency is the Environmental Protection Agency. And as their name goes, they are concerned in protecting the environment. So anything that's going to impact the environment in a negative way, they want to make sure that when it spills, that there is a secondary containment to make sure you're keeping it in place. They focus on this material entering the waterways and the legislation itself, the rule itself, is the spill prevention and control countermeasure rule. Um, OSHA essentially does the same thing. They have the same concerns, but in their case, they have a focus on the material that can pose a risk to human health. So they are worried about the human health, the, the, the human impact. The EPA is, is worried about the environmental impact Ultimately, they, they work hand in hand and we should be worried about both. So anything that's an oil or anything that's a harmful chemical, 
um, and it's contained in some kind of primary containment, uh, will require a secondary spill containment plan. And that basically says, hey, if this thing lets out, how are we going to handle it? And so the reason we have these rules is because we, you know, as, as industry has gone over, over the years, we've learned many, many lessons in terms of watching something spill out and, and ultimately impacting our water. So this is a map from 1969 to the present of some of the larger oil spills that have affected U.S. waters. So it's not largest oil spills in the water, it's oil spills that have affected water. So one example is the Ashland Petroleum uh, spill in 1988 uh, out in Florida, Pennsylvania, which is by Pittsburgh. And it led to the contamination of the Monongahela River. And in this example, it was a 3.8 million uh, gallon diesel tank, which ultimately collapsed. Now, the reason why it collapsed, yeah, that's, that's absolutely a conversation, but not a focus here. But they had 3.8 million gallon tank and they only had enough you know, secondary containment to contain 2.5 million gallons. So as you can imagine, some of that overflowed and this was on land and ultimately the oil itself or the diesel itself ended up inside of the river and moved on to the Ohio River. So environmentally, a six inch thick oil slick moved to the Ohio River. That's, that's roughly the thickness of your iPhones, right? So that's about six inches thick. That's a lot of oil. From a societal impact, 23,000 residents were without tap water. Why? Because as this material hit the land, it's going to work its way into, our, into the water table, which is you know, where we actually get those aquifers or where we get our drinking water. And so once that's contaminated, we lose our, our, our places from which we get water. And then economically, $18 million in fines and cleanup costs. And I can promise you this, uh, almost 30 years later, it's going to be a whole lot more. So just taking a look, uh, you know, pictures say a lot. This is where the tank used to be. You can see it completely collapsed. It's obliterated. All of these other containments were, were filled up. Uh, it was almost like a lake next to the tank itself. It's an extremely dangerous situation, one spark in the wrong spot, and this thing would light up. So you already have a, a much larger hazard than even you might think right on face value. And then when you looked at the impact of the river, you know, I've personally spent time on emergency response. I've seen oil spill into, spill into rivers before I've been a part of containing them. And quite frankly, when you're talking about six inches thick, there, there's very little that you're going to be able to do in a quick emergency response to help you clean that up. And that's just going to create bigger problems. And so when we talk about solutions for chemical containment areas, we're not just talking about, you know, the obvious thing, which is, okay, I have a volume of X that I need to contain. Have I done my math correctly? We absolutely want to be a part of making sure that you've done that part right. But also beyond that, we want to talk about what can happen even if you're volumetrically correct. So anytime you have a containment area, if you follow my laser pointer here, you're always going to have some kind of a corner, some kind of a rim that you need to make sure has good integrity. So these corner areas, when you're made of metal, oftentimes that's where you'll find a weld. A weld is an area of a lot of stress uh, when uh, uh, containment is put together. And quite frankly, an area of stress is a potential opportunity for failure. So we want to take a look at those. If you're talking about a concrete containment, you know, you might be in a position where you kind of got slabs sitting on each other and you might have caulk. That caulk may go bad. Uh, delamination is another potential area where you may be exposed. Delamination is essentially when concrete is put down and it's installed incorrectly. What happens is it becomes white and flaky. It starts falling apart. It doesn't really have great integrity. And now all of a sudden you've got a lot more porosity in your concrete. And it's just going to be that much quicker that if something does spill into your secondary containment, now it's going to work its way into the soil. Um, cracking is pretty self-evident. You have very large slabs of concrete. The ground starts moving. The cracks appear. You know, whatever you're trying to contain moves right into the crack. I think you, you folks can figure that one out. And then finally, uh, you know, in the event that you've got some expansion joints put into place, you really want to watch those expansion joints because, again, much like you would see in the corner areas, that's where you're going to see a lot of caulk. Uh, sometimes that caulk isn't necessarily chemical resistant. And even if it is, if it starts breaking apart because it dries out over time, the fact of the matter is it's just another opportunity for your chemical to enter the soil. And so our conversation today is really going to be about what are the different ways that we can offer you some support in, you know, one, figuring out is your containment good enough? And two, you know, what are the things that we can do to help you repair that? So I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Chris Mahoney. He's our application specialist that's going to talk a little bit more in depth of some of the examples 
Um, I talked a little bit on the high level, so we get really in the examples. And after that, we're going to have Mark Borski, uh, who's our technical manager, join us for a question and answer. So, Chris, take it away. Thanks, AJ. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to take a look at some actual work that we've done here at Banks Industrial Group on secondary containment. Um, here we have a before and after shot. Uh, this is actually at a local chemical plant. Um, there's secondary containment here uh, for the rail car loading area. So the way this works is a rail car pulls into the station here for loading. Uh, there's a retractable arm over here on the left that comes over top and fills the tanker, um, in this case with sulfuric acid. And the containment here below is, you know, to, to uh, capture any potential spills that may occur during the, the filling station uh, process. So if you look closely, uh, each panel has a drain in it, and these drains have captured any spill and uh, funnel it into the underground storage um, unit. Now, the underground tank was actually in good condition. The reason they called us out um, was because of the issues they were having on the surface. So the left photo is a close-up of an area where they were having some disbombment issues on, along their seams. Um, you know, over time, the elements just baking in the sun and the movement of these heavy rail cars uh, create these issues. So we had to address those um, a lot as, uh, along with giving it a, a top coat. So uh, what we did was we power washed the entire station with grit to give it a good profile. Uh, we then addressed these issues here with a product called Belzona Super Wrap, which is a carbon and fiberglass cloth mixed with 100% solids resin. Uh, this gave it the structural integrity it needed, but also you know, bridged the gaps that you see here. So once that was set up and cured, we then applied two top coats of Belzona 4311 uh, over the entire loading area, which has a um, excellent resistance to sulfuric acid. So overall, this job took us less than two days and the uh, customer was you know, very pleased with the final results. This job was in a washdown room at a food processing plant uh, where they use various types of acids during their washdown uh, process. So over time, these chemicals, you know, took their toll on the concrete, as you see here, um, some of the really bad areas, it, you know, it just softens the concrete and, and chews it up. So basically what we have to do is we come in, we power wash the entire area, remove any of the deteriorated concrete and, um, you know, vacuum them up. That's what these guys are doing here. And uh, once that's cleaned up, we can then backfill those bed areas with our Belzona mortar grade mix um, for structural repairs. Uh, this, these, this actual product has almost two and a half times the strength of concrete. So these will be a long-term solution for this customer. Once those areas cured, we then applied a two coat system over the entire room. So not only did we do the, the floors, but as you'll see, we also did about two feet up the walls, uh, the stairs leading into the room. And then what you can see in the picture, uh, we did the drains and the pits also in the corners. Um, so now obviously they have a much better system in place and it also allows a lot, a much easier cleanup process for their workers. So anything that's left on the floor from their washdown can now be just squeegeed into the appropriate drains. This next one was pretty nasty. It was a, it was a leaking acid tank. Um, so the leak occurred in the piped area here, right above the containment. Um, so it was just a slow drip, but over time, as you see here on the left, it just took its toll on the concrete um, and it, you know, it really, really busted it up and ate away at it. So we came in during one of the shutdowns um, and we were able to get all this done in less than 24 hours. So we basically showed up, um, you know, 7 a.m. on, a, I think it was a Thursday. We work around the clock and we're done around 3 or 4 a.m. the following day. So not only was the customer pleased that we were able to provide a solution, but they were really happy with our ability to respond quickly. And you know, the scope of work here basically was when we showed up, we, we neutralized the acid with uh, baking soda and then power washed the area, removing any um, compromised concrete. And uh, we backfilled in the, the bad areas with a product called Belzona 4181. Um, again, another strong chemical resistant product. Once those areas were rebuilt, we then put a two coat system over the entire containment, um, as, which is the red finish that you see here. We did, besides the floors, we also did the curb along the top, as well as the wall here in between the two areas. 
And um, you know, so now this is this is structurally sound and ready to go for any potential spills. This video on the right here is just an illustration of untreated concrete and how it reacts to an acid spill. So as you see, it just absorbs the acid and um, you know it's soaking into the concrete. The red, the, the right side is actually a belzona treated portion of concrete. And as you see, when the acid's poured on top of that belzona coating, um, it just kind of pulls and, and stays at the top of the surface. So if that were to happen here in our containment area, um, it would basically just stay on the surface until they were able to clean up the actual spill. This next job was a hospital sump that they had installed. Uh, basically, they, they decided to recover heat from the wastewater in the laundry room by installing a heat exchanger. Um, the system required a sump for the wastewater to pass through, and since it was drilled from solid concrete, um, they had to find a way to you know, coat this and protect it. So what we did was, if you look here on the left, you'll see these drill core marks. We filled those in with Belzona 4141 and then screeded over a two coat system over the entire area. So not a very large job in size, but from an environmental standpoint, still very important. This next one was definitely larger in size. Uh, fortunately for the customer, they didn't need to coat the entire containment area. Um, this was at a wastewater treatment facility and their cost of containment here, um, you'll see the white tanks, they're filled with um, hydrochloric acid and those, the containment here was actually in good shape, but what we had to do was provide a solution for them along their columns and walls, they were having separation and cracking, so, and as well as between the floor and the walls. So these, these black lines that you see here uh, throughout, um, are actually our Belzona product. So it's 2211 is the name of it. It's an elastomer product. Uh, so what that does is it has elasticity to allow movement with the concrete that it naturally has, um, but also providing chemical resistance. So if there were to be a spill, um, this product could help absorb and, and, and contain that, that chemical. We thought this would be a good slide to in incorporate into our presentation because it just illustrates how, you know, not every containment is gonna be the same and every repair or application is not gonna be the same either. This was kind of a unique application as well. So this was a chemical storage facility. They reached out to us because they were looking for a way to prevent any spills that may occur inside their warehouse um, from leaving the building. So what we proposed and what we came up with was a firm system that we installed in front of their doorways. Um, you know, the, the, the concerns were they have forklifts driving around their warehouse with pallets of drums filled with chemicals. And if, we're, if one of those drums were to be punctured or to spill, uh, again, they just need to prevent that material from leaving the building. So these berms were built uh, by us in place. Our prep basically just involves grinding up the concrete to give it a good profile so our Belzona could anchor into it. We use a former. Um, to give it this, this nice curb look that you see here. And once that was set up and cured, we then just put a top coat of a high-vis yellow on, since it is a high foot traffic area, um, and we wanted to be conscious of you know, the safety of the workers. The final job we'll look at here is a truck loading pad at a chemical manufacturer. So this was an outdated uh, fiberglass mat system. I believe it was installed in the late 80s. Um, they needed you know, a new solution uh, for this system, for this area. So we came in and we uh, first had to address the fiberglass mat and remove that, obviously, since it was deteriorating, which was no easy task. Um, I was actually on the job site for the for one of these days as the guys were removing that. And uh, we had multiple, you know, scrapers, um, shovels, pry bars, anything we could use to get that up and out. So that was, that took some time. And then once we did, you'll see here in the left-hand corner, there's some, deep uh, concrete repair area that needed to be addressed as well. So we used our mortar grade to, to fill those in. We diamond grind cut at the entire surface area for a good profile. And then uh, we applied our Belzona 4000 series, two coats. And what we did was we actually incorporated some garnet on the top coat for a slip resistant surface. So that way the truck drivers and anyone else that might be walking in this area, you know, are safe from basically slipping. Um, that also helps dissipate the heat from the tires of these large uh, trucks. So in the summertime, you know, when it's about 95 degrees out and these trucks are pulling in here, you know, approximately 10,000 pounds of weight, 
um, the, the tires are already on fire from driving on the hot asphalt. So we want to help dissipate that heat and protect the system that we just installed. Overall, this job took about five days. Uh, we worked 10 hour shifts during the day and then followed that with 10 hour shifts at night. So the five days that it took to complete kept us in within the allotted time that the customer allowed for us to do these repairs. And um, you know they were extremely happy with that because these truck delivery deliveries are essential to their plant operations. Um, so again, you know they were really pleased with the final product, but also our ability to uh, stay on schedule. So I hope these were you know helpful in, in showing the ways that we can uh, help your facility. Basically, some takeaways that we want to leave you with are you know you want to properly identify the areas of your second secondary containment and put a plan in place to you know, protect these areas. Um, frequently conduct inspections to make sure that they're still in compliance and check for any identified degradations. And then if you do need repairs, obviously we, you, know, you can reach out to us and we will be happy to help you with those, um, those areas. So now I'm gonna uh, kick it back to Aria and she's gonna field any questions that you may have for AJ or myself. Aria? All right, thank you so much. Thank you, AJ and Chris, for a great presentation. Um, for the audience to know, we are bringing Mark Borski on. He is our technical manager, and he'll be here to answer questions along with AJ and Chris during this Q&A session. Just so you know, you will receive a follow-up email after this webinar is over. It'll include some more information on secondary containment solutions, as well as a link to the recording of this webinar that will be placed on, on YouTube later this afternoon. Um, if you want more information on Think Big Solutions, be sure to visit our website at banksindustrial.com and visit our Big Learning Center, which has everything from interactive solutions maps to past webinars, informational videos, and case studies. Also, if you're interested in learning more about Belzona, you can visit our website at belzonareptech.com. This will stay up for the remaining of the Q&A session. Please be sure to send over your questions and we're gonna go ahead and get started with AJ, if you could, um, thank you for sharing secondary containment solutions. Do you also service the tanks within the containment areas? So that's a really good question. So yes, um, obviously if you have secondary containment and you might have a spill, that means whatever your primary containment is uh, obviously failed or failed in some way. So yeah, in generally speaking as a Belzona uh, dealer and as with the Belzona products, we are able to actually go in and depending upon the service and the and the temperature of the containment and the way in which it built it failed, there may be opportunities for us to not only help you repair that particular piece of equipment, but also we can help you evaluate other pieces of equipment which could potentially uh, be exposed and may potentially have the same problems. Uh, we can help you with preventative solutions there. And if you have new containment areas that are new primary containment areas that are going into service, and you're concerned about potentially those causing problems, uh, we can work through solutions that can help you prevent a uh, loss of primary containment under those conditions as well. Great, thank you so much, AJ. Um, another question we have, I'm gonna send this over to Mark. Our facility uses steam tracing and we experience coding failure in our containments under our steam traps. How would you address this issue? That's actually a really good question. So, um, coatings uh, that you would use in a, a chemical resistant containment area um, are going to have different heat resistances uh, based on the coating. Uh, typically, um, when a coating is specified for a containment area, the information gathered is usually that it's going to be operating at an ambient temperature. So, um, it's very common for uh, the coating that's chosen for that containment to not be able to handle the heat from, from a steam trap. Um, so that being said, that's a localized issue. So, um, you know, while we, while coating and protecting secondary containments is, is, is very, very important, um, it's also um, the infrastructure of the plant. So, um, you do want to manage the cost related to that. So as you move into these higher temperature resistant coatings, you're going to move into more expensive coatings. 
So what we'll typically do is mix and match coatings within, within a, a vessel or within a containment um, to, to maximize you know, what we can do from a cost standpoint, but also putting the proper coating in the proper place. So um, in a containment, a large containment area that may have a steam drops in a couple of places, we, we might coat the entire containment with our standard coating, which can take temperatures generally up to about boiling. Um, and then we can either install a patch of a high temperature coating directly under the steam trap, or what we've also done is, is bonded uh, a piece of, of stainless steel or coated, coated steel under the steam trap, basically to take the, take the brunt of that heat, since that's only gonna be a localized area. That's a really good question. We, we see that all the time where the, the containment coating has been penetrated at the steam trap. And, in, and once you have that, that penetration, um, you've basically lost, you've lost containment at that point. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, for Mahoney, could you let the audience know what areas we service for both companies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a distributor of Belzona products, we do have a geographical area that we um, you know, sell in, which is New Jersey, Delaware, Western New York, and Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, but as a company, for us to do, do these repairs, we can actually mobilize you know, anywhere in the country, basically. So we don't have any restrictions uh, as to where we can do the, these types of repairs. Although uh, we do have folks on here from Australia. I don't know if we're going to go that far to... Uh, but I think everyone else within is within well within reach. I wouldn't mind the trip. <laughs> I'll go. Great, thank you. Before I ask this next question, next question, um, Francisco, I see that your hand is raised. If you would please submit your question via the question section, and I'll be happy to relay it to the panelists for them to answer. Um, Mark, another question. What are the chemical resistance requirements for coatings and linings and secondary containments? It's another really good question. So um, the, the requirements here in the US basically are the expectation is that a chemical spill is going to be cleaned up immediately as quickly as possible, um, generally within 72 hours. So once again, this, this, this goes over to cost. When you look at the chemical resistance of a particular coating, um, you're generally looking at whether that coating is suitable for full immersion in that chemical 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, or 10 years, let's say. Um, in a secondary containment, you may not need that level of, of, of chemical resistance. So using that chemical resistance chart might drive a client to need to choose a coating that is is more than they, what they actually need for secondary containment. So one of the things that we've started doing here at Belzona um, is creating a chemical resist resistance chart that that has columns for full immersion for for services primary containment uh, service, and then we also do specific testing for 72 hours and uh, for, for 60 days. So we can then recommend the appropriate coding for secondary containment without having uh, to stretch the budget, let's say, into something that, that uh, you may not actually need for that secondary containment. That being said, if you do have a spill and you have a coding in that containment uh, that is only rated for a short-term duration, you, you may, as part of the cleanup and as part of the remediation, you may have to, to recode that containment. But you know, you're you're hoping that your primary containment is gonna is gonna is is gonna stay. So hopefully you're not using your secondary containment. Great. Thank you, Mark. For AJ, could you give a brief overview of our companies so that the audience understands our two companies? Yeah, no problem. So uh, Banks Industrial Group and Belzona Repair Technologies are, are kind of two, two companies that kind of exist together. So the repair technology portion, we're basically the consultants and distributors of the Belzona technology itself. Uh, think of Banks Industrial Group as more the contractor arm that will actually come out and install and execute the work for you. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, please refer to the question section. I'll make sure to clarify it. Um, for Mark, could you speak on the different types of containment uh, coatings that there are? And we have this question here that asks, what's the max temperature and pH resistance of this product? But I know that there are a variety of products that you could use for different solutions. So could you just give a brief overview? Sure. Um... So pH is a common is a common thing that we're I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump to that and I'll back up a little bit. Um, when we want when we want to specify a coating for chemical resistance, whether it's in a, a secondary containment, whether it's in a primary containment, whether it's in a process vessel, um, we want to know the specific chemistries that are in there. And the pH the pH is important, but the pH doesn't tell me what chemical is in there. We may have a low pH uh, with with an organic acid that, that a coating may not be resistant to, or we may have a really low pH with another um, inorganic acid that the coating is very resistant to. So it's very important for us to know the specific chemistry and chemicals that, that the coating may or may not see. Um, there's a, a, a variety of, of coatings. Primarily, you're looking for probably an epoxy coating within a containment. Um, as you get into uh, the, the more acidic environments, if you're dealing with sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid, um, you're going to move to a coating that has uh, some Novolac component of it. Um, it's really, it, it's, it's going to vary a little bit on that. It's, it's the same uh, information that we gather for, for any coating that we're going to install. We need to know the temperatures, we need to know um, the chemistry, um, and then we also look at other things like, you know, what do you do to clean the area? We, we may put a chemical resistant coating um, in a containment and then it's steam cleaned or there's some sort of cleaner that's used in there that, that is aggressive. Um, the question was also about temperature. Um, in a containment, really, the highest temperature you're really going to ever deal with is really whatever the boiling point is of, of, of that material because you're, you're open to the atmosphere. Um, you may get something a little hotter just as it comes out of the tank, for example. Uh, asphalt might be a good example. You know, asphalt runs above 300 degrees. So, you know, when it comes out of the tank, it could be that three, 350 temperature, but as it sees the air, it's gonna cool down. So our coatings, um, temperature resistance uh, is, for, for instance like that, is, is gonna be around 400 degrees, which is well above anything that you would see um, in, a, in a secondary containment, I would expect. Um, we see molten sulfur sometimes, um, that, that can be pretty hot. Um, and we have test data for specific things like that that we would address, but um, we, we need the information and we put it into um, in our database and, and, and come up with an answer for you. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to send them through right now. I'll give you a few seconds. And if there's anything else that the panelists feel like they missed or that they wanted to touch on, there's a great time to do so. There's one thing I want to address. One, one more thing. We we're talking about chemical resistance um, and the Novolax. So when you get into your acid resistant coatings, uh, you're going to get into um, coatings that are, are more highly cross-linked. So they're, they tend to be more brittle. Um, and one thing you see in concrete containments is concrete um, in its nature tends to crack, uh, tends to shrink, it tends to move with heat. Um, so you have to be careful what coatings you put in a containment area, um, that they're not too rigid. Um, so for example, you know, we have developed a coating that is, is a little, it's acid resistant, but it has a little bit more flexibility to it uh, that can handle those micro cracks are in the containment because if you have cracks in your containment and, and they and they they transmit through the coating, uh, what we call it mirror cracking when the concrete cracks and, and it cracks the coating, um, you then lost containment. So you need to you need to make sure that you're you're using a coating that's going to be flexible enough uh, to move with that concrete and, and handle those well, micro cracks in the concrete. Awesome. We did have one more question come through. I'm going to leave this up in the air. 
Sorry about that. Do you have bonding agents to bond your repair mortars to the existing concrete? Yeah, so that that's actually a really good question. And maybe that even gets a little bit into the conversation around, you know, the surface prep and how do we how do we actually adhere Belzona to concrete itself? So um, the good thing about Belzona and the good thing about concrete with concrete being so porous is that it provides Belzona material the ability to anchor directly to the concrete itself. And so the bond between the Belzona and the concrete is actually stronger than the than the the, the strength of the, the concrete has with itself. So if it's gonna if it's gonna break apart, you'll actually see the bond between the concrete and the Belzona remain, and that'll be where it's it's stronger because the cohesive strength of concrete is less. So with that said, when we're gonna when we're gonna go in and we're looking to repair a concrete you know area, and you might see some of those areas might have been eaten away. You know, aside from just general cleanup, it provides us very good anchor points. And what we would do is we go in with Belzona mortar and we kind of build out that concrete and kind of make everything flat and level. And then from a cost perspective, that might be less. And then we would go over it with a chemical resistant um, of material then. And that'll help you, A, rebuild your concrete so it looks better. So it's, it's flat, it's nice, it looks appropriate. But then we'd be able to offer you the chemical resistance as well. Yeah, I just want to jump in real quick because a bonding agent, that's that's more of a terminology that would probably be used with a cementitious repair. Mm -hmm. you know, concrete to concrete, there's bonding agents that you put on to to try and bond, to get the concrete to stick to the existing concrete, which which it really doesn't real well. Um, uh, Chris Chris Mahoney had an example there. If you guys saw the uh, the sump that had the red coating in there, that was. So our, our, our repair motors are, are, are epoxy, so there's no water in them. There's there's epoxy resin, and then you've got your aggregate mixed in. And, and so by nature, they're already extremely chemical resistant. And many times the repair mortar can be the coating. So in that example, uh, that red material was a high temperature acid resistant repair mortar. And there was a primer that went on there just to, just to help it adhere to the concrete. But that was a one step application. There was the primer was applied, and then the the the, the Belzona 4181 repair mortar was installed, and that was it. Um, that would be an example of something that would replace acid brick, for example. So um, there's no need for a coating on top of that. It's non-porous and chemical resistant. Also, might I add, the next Belzona, the next webinar we're going to do is on concrete and concrete repairs. So we're definitely going to get more in depth on that next time. Thank you. Um, just one more follow-up question, Mark. You mentioned the resin. Um, do you have an estimated cure time for that resin? So that's a question we get all the time with all of our materials: is how long does it take to cure? So when we mix epoxies together, we're creating a chemical reaction, and it's it's all dependent upon temperature. The hotter it is, the more quickly it's going to cure. The general rule of thumb is about every 20 degrees that you move the needle. Uh, upwards, you, and this is Fahrenheit, every 20 degrees Fahrenheit that you increase the temperature, you half the cure time. So, and there's a couple different cures. There's cures to the point where you can walk on something, for example, and there's there's a full cure where it gets its full chemical resistance. So, typically, most of our materials are cured the same day where you can, you can walk on them, you can drive on them um, for or chemical resistance, uh, it may it may take you know several days before it reaches its full chemical resistance cure. For secondary containment, that's not as critical as it would be for a process vessel, um, where we would be looking to, to to reach that full cure prior to putting that vessel back in, in service. Um, so generally, the answer is the next day. You can you can utilize that, that containment as far as getting in there, walking around. Um, you know, servicing valves and tanks and whatnot. Thank you all so much for presenting and for being here for this Q&A session. Thank you to the audience for attending. At this time, we're going to wrap the webinar. You will receive a follow-up email with the contact information for all panelists, as well as a recording of this webinar so that you can re-watch or you can reach out to us if you have any more questions. Thank you for being here and have a great day. Take care, everybody. Bye.